Just wanted to say hello and welcome to those who are trickling in. Thank you for being on time and we will begin shortly. All right, everybody, we're going to kick off. So welcome and thank you so much for joining us on this lovely Friday. We are here on behalf of Operation Armenia to give you an overview of this past year and discuss what we're doing next. We have some incredible speakers with us today. And before we officially begin, I did want to start with some housekeeping items. The first of which is that we will be using the Zoom webinar Q&A function later in this session. So when the time comes, we invite you to put your questions into the Q&A function that's on your Zoom toolbar. It's a button there. And if you have any problems finding that, please feel free to reach out to us via chat. Um, but actually, the chat will be disabled for the general public. If you do need to privately message us, we can make that available to you. But apart from that, this webinar is recorded. And if you um, choose to, we can circulate this to you after the presentation as well. So with that being said, welcome. And let's give you a quick, brief, a quick breakdown of what we're going to be reviewing today. So. We're going to have some welcome remarks from myself and my, co my colleague, Cosmic, and then an executive summary of Operation Armenia and all that we've done. And then we have some amazing speakers with us here today to give you some spotlights and uh, some highlights of the great work that has been done this past year. And we'll have a Q&A, like I mentioned, at the end of all of this, followed by some quick closing remarks. So with that being said, let me introduce myself properly. My name is Alina and I am the inaugural program manager of Operation Armenia. Operation Armenia began about a year ago and I recently joined the team and I've already met so many incredible people from the UCLA community and the AUA community and other partners in um, Armenia and here. So it's been a wonderful opportunity so far. And prior to this, I used to work at UCLA Anderson on the other side of campus, but I'm excited to be here doing something that is really beneficial to my personal homeland. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to my colleague Cosmic from the Promise Institute for some remarks. Hi, 
Greetings and a warm welcome to you all. My name is Hasmik Bagdasarian. I'm the Deputy Director of the Promised Armenian Institute at UCLA. And it is my privilege to welcome you all to our webinar that is part of UCLA's 2021 International Education Week titled Operation Armenia, a year in review, international humanitarian aid to long-term infrastructure support. International Education Week is a nationwide initiative of the US Department of State and Education, which in UCLA consists of a series of events, activities, exhibits, and performances that offer students the opportunity to expand their perspectives across borders and disciplines, faculty, and occasion to share their research on global topics, on the general public a chance to discover many global dimensions of the top public university in the country. One such global initiative is Operation Armenia, which unfortunately formed following the war launched on nagorno karabakh or Artsakh in the late September of 2020 amidst a raging pandemic. As an interdisciplinary team from UCLA Health, under the auspices of the Promise Armenian Institute, started providing emergency humanitarian assistance to those affected by the war, as well as the ongoing pandemic. Various working groups concentrated on meeting the region's most pressing needs, from procuring life-saving medical supplies to assisting with blood donation processes, to instituting rehabilitation services that provided training and wound care to soldiers, to volunteering on various capacity building projects with the Armenian Mental Health Initiative, to providing guidelines on evidence-based management of COVID and more. However, as the immediate shock of the war waned in the months following the November 9th ceasefire agreement, the focus of many of these working groups shifted from immediate disaster relief to long-term infrastructure support. On today's webinar, we'll discuss this shift as well as the ongoing and future projects of Operation Armenia. With this, on behalf of the Promise Armenian Institute, I want to thank our panelists both for their participation in today's webinar as well as for their extensive work they've been carrying out in Armenia. And I also want to thank the leadership of Operation Armenia, namely Drs. Eric Estrelian, Sean Chakardinian, and Alina Dorian. So as my colleague Alina mentioned, following our presentations, you will have the opportunity to ask questions to our speakers. You may do so using the Q&A function that is visible at the bottom of your screens. So please type your questions as succinctly as possible, and we will pose them to our speakers during the Q&A portion of the webinar. Finally, if for any reason our webinar turns off or your connection fails, you may reconnect back to the webinar using the same link you're using now, the one that was emailed to you during the registration process. And with this, I will pass the podium back to Alina Sarkisian, the program manager of Operation Armenia, who will lead us into today's program. Alina, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Hasmi. So I'm definitely going to tap into um, a lot of the elements that Hasmik mentioned. And I want to begin <clears throat> this presentation today by giving everyone here just an overview of Operation Armenia and what we've done this past year and what we're looking to do next. So before we really go into Operation Armenia, it's very important to kind of take a step back and do a brief primer on the Artsakh War of 2020, which was a historical event that took place last year. And I'm not sure if our audience is all knowledgeable on the topic. So I wanted to start by providing an overview of it and um, just a summation. There's so many details to this, by the way. There's a very lengthy history to this, but I'm just going to touch on the highlights of it or the lowlights and um, Hopefully that will provide context for why Operation has Op Op Operation Armenia has done what it has done this past year. So um, Artsakh is also known as Nagorno-Karabakh, and it is an autonomous republic that is mostly full of ethnic Armenians, and it's an area region that broke from Azerbaijan after the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991. And last year on September 27th specifically, Azerbaijan executed a military aggression against Artsakh that led to a 44 day war between the two, uh, between Armenia and Azerbaijan since Armenia has been dominantly helping Artsakh these past, um, these past years. And Azerbaijan has also done this with the support of Turkey. So it has been a very um, 
detrimental and difficult time for the Armenian nation and especially for those living in Artsakh. And that's what Operation Armenia has primarily responded to in this past year. So this 44 day war resulted in thousands of deaths, a countless number of prisoners of war and more than half of the Artsakh population being forced to displace and move to Armenia, being displaced from their homes uh, due to the fact that when this war ended, a peace deal was signed between Russia, Azerbaijan, and Armenia that resulted in handing over parts of Artsakh to Azerbaijan. So for the safety of the ethnic Armenian population living in Artsakh, a lot of them had to move and just pick up their things burn their homes and move to Armenia. So this past Monday, actually, we had some renewed aggression from Azerbaijan and it's been the worst that it has been since this uh, war ended last year. And so this presentation is quite timely for that reason, because as you can see, Operation Armenia's purpose is, you know, there's a constant resurgence of purpose because this ordeal is not anywhere near over and we are here to support in many different ways. And before I go on about Operation Armenia and the more specific things we've done, I do want to mention also that on March 23rd of 2020, the UN publicly declared a global military ceasefire because they wanted all focuses to be on defeating the pandemic. So, you know, unfortunately, this attack had also happened during an incredibly vulnerable time. And despite, so it was very intentional to attack amidst a pandemic and during this incredibly difficult time already for the world. Um, and it has obviously, the situation, this war has obviously worsened the situation of the pandemic in that region, um, since it has been difficult to focus resources on fighting that when there's an actual military aggression taking place at the same time. So with that, now hopefully with that context, you can understand how Operation Armenia was formed. It was in direct response to this 44 day war and it was a, a unity between all different resources and entities at UCLA, prominently the Promise Armenian Institute, and also in collaboration with the UCLA Fielding School of Public Health and UCLA Health. So for the past year, Operation Armenia has mainly focused on immediately uh, immediate medical disaster relief, but we have also tried to focus on public health programming, medical programming, and working with the Ministry of Health to help them respond to their needs, especially obviously in regards to the pandemic. And I would be remiss not to mention, as Hasmi did as well, doctors Eric Israelian, Shansha Kardimian, and Alina Dorian. They have been the fearless leaders that have started this, ignited this entire effort. And of course, the heartbeat of this entire effort is the volunteers, which I will highlight in another slide. But we just have incredible volunteers from the UC Health side, from the entire UC system, who have all put aside countless hours outside of their day jobs to also help with this effort. So before I continue, I also wanted to just point our attention to the photos on the left side of the screen and primarily the one on the bottom. I think it really gives you a picture of that's a photo from the Atlantic. It was taken in November of last year and it's just a depiction of how many families were just stuck in traffic on the road leaving Artsakh to find safe haven in Armenia. So we have been trying um, endlessly to help all of them. So Operation Armenia, when we got started last year, we had to kind of triage what we were going to do and how we were going to be most effective. And that ended up turning into these seven work groups that you see on the screen. So I'm going to just quickly gloss over these, especially because our three speakers are representing three respective work groups from here. Um, but as you can see, we have our blood bank work group, a COVID-19 work group, which has really transformed into so many different purposes which is probably not surprising to hear given the gravity of the situation on COVID. 
We have focused on rehab and wound care for the soldiers of the war. We have a great mental health team that you'll hear from Valentina, just the different ways we're trying to address the extremely large topic of mental health in Armenia. Um, we are trying to coordinate efforts to just assist the displaced populations as much as we can. Medical supplies, of course, anything that we can provide that is a vital item that it's hard for them to acquire themselves. And then um, our lovely Hasmig and her PR team has been doing a great job just promoting what we have been doing so that we can also get on the map that way. So I, I wanted to just include this slide very quickly to just show you. Um, I looked through the entire list of Operation Armenia volunteers, and these are all the backgrounds that we have. We have so many incredible doctors and nurses. Uh, we have program managers. We have people in marketing. We have a, a broad range of incredible people who mostly are in the healthcare system, which of course means that they have been inundated with countless hours of work already this year due to COVID this year and last, um, but they have also been giving us their additional time for Operation Armenia and we are in extremely grateful. So with that, um, I do wanna quickly orient to the next steps. Operation Armenia is here to stay and we are trying to shift a little bit from that immediate disaster relief to long-term sustainable programming. We really wanna put systems in place and we really wanna work with Armenia's Ministry of Health to create something that is more long-term and beneficial for uh, the Republic of Armenia. So the first step in doing that is identifying that we really wanna focus on primary healthcare in Armenia. We want to flip something that is called the inverted pyramid, which means we want to make primary healthcare the largest part of that pyramid you can see on the left hand of the screen. We want to have um, preventative care be a primary focus in that country so that we are not overwhelming the system there, the hospital system as a result. And we have already started this by working on a special task force with the Ministry of Health to redefine primary health care programming. And if you stick with us in this next year, there's going to be lots of um, substantial updates on this. But we're in the, the preliminary steps of accomplishing these very large goals. And we have also uh, bucketed these three, these, we've created these three tiers of uh, focuses that we want to um, implement and take action on for this next year of Operation Armenia. So the first of which is we want to focus on primary health care, like I said, but that also means, you know, evaluating all the work groups that we've created and seeing which of them should stay, which of them should transform into something else. Uh, we want to make sure that all of our volunteers um, always have something meaningful to do. And sometimes that means evaluating what we've already done and seeing if it's still efficient and necessary for the next year. And we also, like I said, want to just really use our brains and think of innovative ways to help with the primary health care needs of Armenia. And of course, do that alongside them and make sure we're working on this together. And then the next thing we want to do the second bucket, if you will, is something called the push-pull programming model. So through the generosity and the um, resources of the Promise Armenian Institute, we want to push out uh, requests for proposals from the community that the Promise Armenian Institute can fund that will fall under these initiatives and goals that we're trying to set for the next year. And then the pull of this model is going to be carefully monitoring and evaluating um, what we decide to fund and also, of course, publicizing these projects and making sure that they flourish. And then lastly, we think that it's extremely necessary to continue focusing on the UCLA community and to collaborate with the continuing education community. So we want to prioritize students, staff, you know, residents, uh, faculty, Everyone, we want them to feel like they have a role to play in Operation Armenia because they do. We don't want to just focus on, um, you know, 
primary healthcare is important, but we want people who have specialties to feel like they have a role in this as well. So we're going to work on these kinds of collaborations and creating opportunities for collaborations. And we also want to have a bigger role in conferences and workshops so that we can promote what we're doing and um, gain more traction in that way. So with that being said, I've spoken long enough. I'm going to introduce our first speaker. We're going to go into the work group spotlights and I'm just so excited for everyone to hear from these amazing ladies. The first of which being Miss Liana Ansrian. So let me just open up her bio very quickly so I can do her justice. Okay. So Ms. Ansrian is a clinical nurse specialist, which is also known as CNS and is board certified in gerontological nursing. She received her Bachelor's of Science in Nursing from the University of Southern California and her Master's in Science of Nursing from the Yale University School of Nursing. Additionally, she is the past president of the California CNS organization, and she's currently a geriatric medicine CNS at UCLA Health, supporting the Medical Center and the Resnick Neuropsychiatric Hospital. Welcome, Liana, and I will stop my share and hand it over to you. Thank you. All right, I'm hoping technology is working. Yeah, all right. Good morning, afternoon, evening to everyone. I'm really honored to share a little piece of the work that I had the great opportunity to collaborate with this amazing team of talented individuals. Um, I had the opportunity to be a part of the blood bank group, which included these individuals, Dr. Nicole Andonian, who's a physician and anesthesia fellow at UCSD. She was with us at UCLA at the time, our group formed. Dr. Sean Sherkidnian, who's the associate professor and pediatric surgeon here at UCLA. Dr. Um, Alyssa Zyman, who's our medical director of transfusion medicine at, at UCLA Health, and myself. There were other individuals on our work group. These were our primary mentors and leaders of the group. During the time of our um, initiation of the program, we very quickly understood and got a sense that the war had demonstrated a very significant shortcoming in Armenia's blood donation and transfusion capacity. And as you can imagine, this is reoccurring or taking place at the time of the COVID-19 pandemic, which presents yet another challenge to equipment and procurement of blood donations. We're fortunate enough to team up with both UCLA and the Hematology and Transfusion Medicine Center in Armenia in Yerevan to provide a long-term sustaining research opportunity so that we can begin to develop an infrastructure to comprehensive blood donation, management, and transfusion for the country as a whole. What we noticed was that there's two buckets of uh, opportunities. One included you know, supplies and, and um, what was needed, but also the infrastructure education and training, which is more of our overarching long-term goal. So our overall goal was to establish and is to establish transfusion medicine and a clinical training program and research opportunities as a collaborative between UCLA and the Hematology and Transfusion Medicine Center in Yerevan. So our process, um, which was interesting and exciting because you are faced with a blank sheet of paper and you get to de develop the program, which is a passion of mine. We developed the program and created application for fellows that could apply to be a part of the research fellowship. And we um, received two applicants. We did a very brief interview with our applicants to get a sense of what were their goals, what were their passions, and how would UCLA's um, resources be able to support that in the immediate but also long-term opportunities. Um, these two individuals engaged in a brief, brief review of the literature to understand what is currently available in the literature that shows sustainability for the development and infrastructure building for a blood bank and education training. Um, the individuals completed their application. We also had the opportunity to create a tool to assess for and evaluate their application and then were selected into this fellowship opportunity. So just a quick overview of the two fellows. 
Um, one of our fellows, Dr. Julia Desimonian, she's the Educational Coordinator of Pediatric Oncology and Hematology Department. Her proposal predominantly focuses on the crucial role of education and system development, which she has identified several um, exclusive aims to develop a leading and competent professionals, the implementation of international standards and modern monitoring and competency assessment and training, which is necessary not only for the setup, but also the long-term infrastructure and operation. Her colleague, Dr. Miran Martirosian is the Transfusion Medicine Fellow, and his focus is a long-term kind of a, a broader development of a well-functioning both emergency transfusion medical donation services, but again, that long-term sustaining, which may include also mobile banks for donation um, to obtain donations and procurement as, um, of life-sustaining resources. So some of our next steps, which unfortunately were put on hold due to the fluctuating pandemic that we were all facing, um, as the applicants provided, you know, their aims, we also identified an opportunity for these um, fellows to come out to UCLA and Dr. Zyman and her group were so generous to offer educational opportunities as you, um, observership. So our goal is when things are a little bit more settled to have the two physicians from UCLA come out to UCLA, to come out to UCLA from Armenia as a part of the observership experience. They will have the opportunity to observe um, the process of blood donation, processing and procurement, and transfusion and transfusion reaction and management as we practice here in the United States. They'll have the opportunity to, of course, also visit the physical layout of our blood bank to understand how to take these steps and infrastructure back to Armenia. It will be an educational program that we have anticipated for potentially a six month opportunity. Um, so again, as things start to settle with COVID, we look forward to welcoming these two individuals. Um, also one of our long-term next steps and overarching goals is to take this model and duplicate this for other opportunities outside of a blood bank transfusion setting, maybe for geriatrics, pediatrics, wound care, so we hope to be the first team to set up this type of observership and program for long, long sustaining um, collaboration between Armenia and UCLA. Thank you. Thank you so much, Liana. And now I'm going to share my screen once more so that we can introduce our lovely next speaker, Ms. Lucina Mushavian. So Lucine is a research lecturer and research associate at the Zavart Avedisian Onanyan Center for Health Services Research and Development, which is also known as CHSR for short. She has been involved in various CHSR projects since 2012, particularly focusing on tuberculosis research and health services quality assessment. She co-teaches Global Health and is a teaching associate for the Basics of Healthy Lifestyle course for the AUA undergraduate students. From 2013 to 2017, Lucina worked as the Master of Public Health Recruitment Coordinator. She earned her MPH degree from the American University of Armenia in 2014. And during her studies, she received full merit-based scholarships from AUA and the Ministry of Education and Science of the Republic of Armenia. Lucina also earned a Master of Social Work degree from the Yerevan State University in 2012. Before joining CHSR, Lucina worked and volunteered in different organizations in the field of social protection, both governmental and non-governmental, focusing on social and health policy evaluation, research, and analysis. Welcome, Lucina. And I will again stop my share so that you can start yours. Um, thank you very much for introduction. And um, this is really a very um, pleasant opportunity to be with you and um, to be able to present whatever we have done over the uh, past um, eight to 10 months or so. Um, just a second, let me uh, quickly figure this out. <laughs> Sorry for the technical issue. Um, 
Um, so I will be presenting today the COVID-19 home health program. Um, a few words um, about the overall background of the program. So you know that due to the COVID-19 pandemic, um, almost in every corner of the world, the healthcare systems were overloaded and Armenia was not an exception. Um, and um, given the fact that uh, many of COVID-19 patients may need oxygen health oxygen therapy and that there is potential opportunity to conduct this oxygen therapy at home, um, these uh, three points actually led to the main rationale of this program that home oxygen therapy for COVID-19 patients can be an alternative treatment strategy, which also reduces the patient load from the healthcare facilities. And this is how this um, program was designed and um, this, this was the main rationale behind um, this program. Um, it offers an innovative care program for low equity COVID cases. And uh, the main aim of the program is to free up the hospital beds um, and of course healthcare personnel and to give them opportunity to meet the needs of the more severe COVID cases. Basically the patients whose main reason for remaining in the hospital is oxygen therapy, have the opportunity to be cared for in their own home. And um, during this care process, um, there is a comprehensive clinical visit program, and uh, the patients are also provided with in-home oxygen concentrator. So um, let me also um, give you a little bit um, more um, background in terms of what were the main aims of this program. So uh, on one hand, uh, the program supports Armenia's healthcare system's ability to manage hospital uh, capacities more effectively. But on the other hand, it uh, makes uh, the healthcare services more closer to the patients in a sense that it provides safe in-home oxygen therapy and there is no uh, financial cost associated with it. Um, so um, let's uh, review how the program works in general. Um, about 10 months ago or, uh, or so, a clinical protocol was developed by the Operation Armenia team. Um, the team also established inclusion and exclusion criteria for the program. Um, um, there was a patient data platform um, and during the development of that platform, um, CHLA um, helped a lot. Um, other than that, um, oxygen concentrators were provided by Operation Armenia and also the program was uh, supplied with some more oxygen concentrators from the Ministry of Health. Um, after which, um, to kind of uh, um, make it official, a ministerial decree about the program was signed and um, the responsibilities to coordinate this program and the clinical aspects of it were given to the National Burns Center, which is uh, a hospital mainly working uh, in the field of burns. However, during the COVID-19 pandemic, it was repurposed and it also um, had a triage services for the COVID patients. And this was the main reason why the coordination was given to this hospital. Um, and the medical brigades of this um, center serve the enrolled patients. Um, Let's see what the patients receive from the program. So uh, once they, uh, patients meet the inclusion criteria and provide written consent to be enrolled in the program, they are discharged from the hospital earlier and they are taken home with a medical brigade and oxygen concentrator. So in other words, if the only reason for them to stay in the hospital is just to receive oxygen therapy. And if they meet some uh, clinical uh, inclusion criteria, then they have the opportunity to be enrolled in this program. Um, so once discharged from the hospital, the brigade uh, takes them home, they set up the home oxygen therapy. They also train uh, the patients and their families um, how to safely uh, 
adhere to the uh, rules and how to take um, care about themselves. And also the patients are uh, monitored on a daily basis, either through phone calls or by in-person visits if it is needed. Um, as uh, for the clinicians, what the cl clinicians do in this program? Uh, right from the beginning, they screen the patients for inclusion in the program. Then if, um, if everything is fine and if the patient is uh, providing consent, they are enrolled in the program. The clinicians also set up the home oxygen in the home of the patients. They then educate the patients and the families on self-care, monitor them, collect data, which is one of the most important parts of this uh, program, and then finally discharge the patients from the program when um, they need uh, no oxygen therapy anymore, or transfer them to the hospital if, for example, the condition worsens. Um, there are a few steps that we are thinking of. Um, in, in the nearest future. And the first one of them is um, having a comprehensive program evaluation, um, both from the patient's perspective and from the clinician's perspective. Um, as for the patient's perspective, we are conducting a patient satisfaction survey, and we are also planning to start a qualitative exploration of the clinicians and policymakers' perspectives to understand what worked well, what didn't, how we can improve it further, uh, what lessons can we learn from their very first experience. And finally, um, this evaluation will give a solid basis for us to scale up the program and include some other um, conditions, not necessarily COVID. And also there are very, very preliminary ideas um, to have a similar program in Artsakh. Um, this is also one of the next steps. Um, of course, again, as I mentioned, very, very preliminary. Um, I think this is it. I'm happy to respond to any questions and thank you. Thank you so much, Lucy. And if you do have any questions for any of our speakers, uh, please do uh, keep them in mind for the Q&A session since we would love to hear from you during that time. And with that being said, I'm going to sh share my screen one last time. Here we go. And we're going to announce and introduce our last, but certainly not least, lovely speaker, Valentina Ogarian. So Valentina, uh, Dr. Valentina Ogarian is a licensed clinical psychologist, as well as a training director at the UCLA Sims Mann Center for Integrative Oncology. In addition to providing clinical care to patients and families impacted by a cancer diagnosis, Dr. Ogarion teaches, trains, and supervises advanced doctoral interns and students. Dr. Ogarion has received extensive training in building resilience in healthcare providers and is passionate about the role of self-care in healthcare professionals. Dr. Ogarion is involved in various mental health initiatives supporting Armenia and is passionate about providing culturally congruent care in medical settings. Thank you and welcome to Dr. Ogarion. I'll go to your slide. Oh, thank you so much, Alina. I'm uh, incredibly glad to be here and humbled by this opportunity to have worked with such talented uh, professionals in various sectors throughout the last year. So I will speak briefly about the mental health group. Uh, the mental health group is comprised of talented, and yes, maybe I am biased, individuals, all part of UCLA Health and UCLA Public Health. Uh, we represent different disciplines of mental health, including psychology, psychiatry, social work, as well as public health. I will speak about the three primary engagements that we've been involved in in the last year, and then wrap up quickly about potential next steps and potential uh, next trajectory of the mental health subgroup. So UCLA health clinicians have collaborated, joined a collaboration study um, with the CHLA AMHI uh, organizations. We have developed a curriculum of various mental health topics in partnership with our Armenia mental health providers. So the way this came to life um, 
when the war broke out last fall, mental health providers really sought uh, additional educational training um, in response to various topics that were coming up in their treatment and evaluation and assessment with patients. So we were able to identify relevant topics with our Armenia colleagues of what might be helpful during times of crisis, during times of war, where they can seek these types of lectures. So we were able to partner with them and develop these lectures of various mental health topics, including uh, resilience in healthcare providers, as well as ways to support uh, parents addressing the needs of young children during a war. What's been incredibly wonderful about this is that it's been a true collaborative effort with our Armenia mental health providers. The lectures have been developed both in English as well as in Armenian, incorporating a culturally congruent framework, of course. Once all of these topics are developed, then the lectures will live in an online curriculum library and they will become available and accessible to a variety of providers in Armenia, including mental health, uh, primary care health care providers, as well as educators. One potential avenue that this project will take is we're hoping to take it to Armenia next year and be able to have more of an intimate experience with these, with our colleagues that uh, collaborated with us on this project. We are also collaborating with USC on a research project to meet one of two aims. One, to really fill in the gap that is uh, missing in academic literature and research about Armenians. And two, to be able to utilize it as information and data to support healthcare providers when working with Armenians in Armenia. The USC collaboration is a qualitative research study looking at identifying resilience factors in Armenians living in Armenia and Artsakh post-war. I'm incredibly excited about this uh, research um, topic and really looking forward to uh, making sure that it gets published and uh, utilized in an effective way. One uh, also additional project that we worked on in the last year was also supporting and providing mental health and mental wellness to our Armenian students here on campus, undergraduate and graduate students who most certainly were impacted by the nuanced psychological stressors that were present. And yes, these students were not necessarily in Armenia or on the front lines, but many of them had direct relatives uh, that were on the front lines and that were directly impacted. So it was really important to ensure that their mental health was also being supported. At this time, we're at a pretty interesting uh, kind of intersection with the mental health subgroup. We are thoughtfully with um, Alina and others thinking about the restructure and reassessing of mental health needs. Of course, now that the high acuity or alarming rate of, of uh, needs have shifted, potential areas include in continuing to engage in academic research to really fill in that gap that's currently existing and um, potentially also engage in some type of formalized needs assessment of mental health in Armenia. And one area that we are thinking about as well is we strongly believe that mental health consultation and a mental health uh, sort of um, avenue can be relevant and accessible in all the other subgroups that are part of Operation Armenia, including primary health care, for example. So it's an exciting time, I think, to be in the mental health group because we're able to think broadly about potential areas of restructure. And I am available for questions as well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Valentina. And with that, we are ready for our Q&A section of this presentation. So if you do have a question for our amazing panel, please check on your Zoom toolbar where you should see the Q&A button on your toolbar. And if you type in a question there, we will see it and then we can ask it to our panel. So we'll give a little bit of time for people to think of their questions and type it in. And I actually have a few questions myself for the panel, but I'll wait and give precedence to anyone here. I think while we're waiting, I will start with one from my end, which is for the entire panel. And the question is, what is an undervalued area in your work that you would like there to be more focus on? And um, any of you can begin. Uh, 
I can share a, a thought that has you know been in my mind as we started this work. Maybe not directly so much undervalued, but um, I always think as a clinician and as a scientist, um, the opportunity to publish our work and to present in venues like this. Um, you know, being Armenian and that's my homeland, obviously there's just opportunity to continue to share the work that we do. So there's no loss of the culture, there's no loss of the support of the diaspora. So I think that's where I see the biggest opportunity. I'm saddened when I see so many talented individuals um, across the world of Armenian descent. And we haven't, maybe in my biased perspective, um, shared our amazing work in publication so that future generations can leverage the talent that we have now. And that's where I see a great opportunity for us to pivot our focus moving forward. I'll, I'll briefly um, add to Liana and uh, continue that a little bit. I think mental health in general, I, I don't know that I would uh, use the word undervalued necessarily, but I think mental health in general um, doesn't have as much of a punch in the academic literature when it comes to Armenians. And I think that's one area that I'm personally very passionate about and believe that there's a lot of work that can be done uh, so that there is more of an academic lens and a research-based lens to understand the needs of the population in that context, in the mental health context. Um, I will agree to both um, with my colleagues and um, add on my end that um, from practice and from the interactions um, with uh, the people working on the ground, I mean, uh, for example, in the case of uh, COVID-19 in-home program, many of the clinicians are interested in having some more interaction, um, exchange, or it's not necessarily coming to the US and seeing how you, how are things done there, but to have a more, um, um, let's say a more valuable connection with the people there and considering that um, there is this uh, huge commitment um, on the international side, on the side of um, Operation Armenia to support Armenia, etc. So um, the feeling of um, I, I feel that there is a need to um, connect people on the ground. I'm not sure if I could give you the main idea, but something um, something more tangible. Yeah, thank you. So um, we do have a question in the Q&A box that we can see from our end. And so I, I'll just read it out loud. I think it's more for Lucina, but of course our entire panel, if you have anything to say, please do um, pitch in. So someone has asked, the home application of oxygen is an intriguing solution to, um, to efficient, to help with the hospital facilities, basically. Is there any data on whether homes in various areas of Armenia have the electricity, the water, and other hygiene required necessities to enable home application and monitoring of any form of healthcare? Um, thank you very much. This is a very important question. Um, so the vast majority of the homes currently in Armenia have a good um, enough electricity to support home oxygen therapy. Um, in fact, one of the inclusion criteria for the program is to have sufficient electricity so that uh, we can uh, have safe um, home oxygen therapy there. Um, but there definitely is data about um, the electricity supplies and um, to, to the best of my knowledge, uh, the vast majority of the homes have good enough electricity and hygiene to support oxygen therapy in homes. Thank you. Um. Thank you for that, Lucina John. I actually have a question that's specific to you as well. Uh, you're a public health specialist at a time of what is once in a lifetime public health crisis, we hope. 
a uh, year and a half into it, and there is what's in my opinion really um, a, a lot of vaccine hesitancy in Armenia. I mean, um, are there any plans on a national level to curb this hesitancy? And if so, in addition to that, what can UCLA and Operation Armenia do to help with this as well? Um, thank you. This is also a very um, interesting and timely question. And in fact, there are some activities going on with, uh, in collaboration uh, with the uh, Fielding School of Public Health, uh, with the COVID-19 working group. Um, so yes, vaccine hesitancy is an issue in Armenia, and um, this is ra a rather politicized um, issue, and there are many forces in the society working against vaccinations and this really uh, makes um, things worse. Um, as for the um, activities to combat this hesitancy, to debunk some of the myths uh, or um, to raise public awareness, I can bring a few examples of activities that we have carried out uh, with, um, in the scope of um, COVID-19 case investigation and contact tracing program. We have done a lot of vaccine awareness uh, raising. We have done um, outdoor um, advertising advertisements and currently in Yerevan, if you drive in different directions, you will come across to um, billboards, posters on highways in different regions and not only in Yerevan um, about uh, encouraging people to go get vaccinated, uh, talking about the importance of vaccination. We have also made a, a few um, um, TV uh, PSAs and some of them were screened on TV. Again, um, there are there is some work definitely going on, but um, it's it's a, it's never enough. I mean, it, this is the topic that you you all there is always a need, and we can always talk about um, developing this further, improving um, the effectiveness, um, and also in in the school of public health, um, in the scope of different other projects, we also have very intensive public awareness raising campaigns. Um, and this is a very important topic for us. And we are, of course, very much interested in expanding this collaboration further. Absolutely, that's reassuring to hear. I mean, I truly hope all these efforts lead to positive outcomes, but this vaccine hesitancy seems to be a global <laughs> issue right now and politicized everywhere. So we can only try, I suppose. Um, and uh, we have a question for Valentina actually, and uh, it has to do with providing mental health or working on people's mental health at a time where the situation in Armenia and in Artsakh is um, extremely unstable. What is it like prioritizing mental health when I guess the security of uh, the population isn't guaranteed? How do you uh, work with those two factors? Um. Sometimes even with my own patients in oncology, I like to think about some of these as impossible questions um, because they are in fact impossible to answer uh, kind of succinctly or comprehensively. So I myself haven't provided direct mental health care to individuals in Armenia who were impacted by the war, but certainly have worked intimately and closely with mental health providers in Armenia. And so I, I think it would be hard for me to speak about their experience. Um, we wouldn't know that no matter how much we're in adjacent trying to support their wellness or their resilience. Uh, certainly it's, it's challenging. I think one framework we can consider is that during a time of war, it's a time of crisis, and there is a lot of problem solving that's being attempted. So the best that we've done with our initiatives, as well as outside collaborations on mental health work groups, is trying to strengthen the mental health providers in providing the support. So if they've needed additional education on specific techniques, if they needed additional information on specific interventions, um, if they need a general support uh, during a time that's been quite difficult. So that's kind of been our efforts versus providing direct mental health care. Sorry, I know that's not a complete answer, but it's probably the best I can do. And I welcome uh, my colleagues on this panel too, if there's anything they'd like to, they'd like to add.
Well, with that, I think we will conclude the Q&A. And I just have one or two more slides left for everyone. And then we'll wrap this up by 10 o'clock as promised. So I'm going to share my screen again. And just wanted to say a quick thank you once more to all of our amazing speakers today. If you would like to take a moment to, um, I don't know if we have the reactions button on Zoom webinars, but if you wanna give a reactions emoji and you are capable of doing so, please do. Um, but we are so appreciative of all of you speaking here today. Um, I just wanted to bring us back to Operation Armenia and how to get involved. And uh, we have lots of different ways to do that, but I wanted to condense it into two primary ways. The first of which being that every uh, month we have an Operation Armenia General Meeting. It's on the first meeting, uh, first Monday of every month at 7 p.m. And we're really uh, designing these meetings to make sure that you leave having learned something new. And that means we're going to have a lot of uh, UCLA speakers and um, speakers on the ground in Armenia. Actually, our next meeting next month, we're going to have um, an on the ground update uh, from, an, uh, from someone at the Ministry of Health in Armenia about the vaccine situation. So these are a great use of your time and then we'll provide different ways for you to stay involved by attending these meetings. And then of course, we really want to focus on volunteer opportunities that are minimal but meaningful. That is our catchphrase because we understand that everyone is busy with their day jobs, but we want to make sure that when we provide opportunities, you know that it's going to be a good use of your time and it's going to go towards a great mission. So with that, I, um, I'm going to put into the chat a link to a sign up form in case anybody would like to sign up to attend these meetings or just be more involved with Operation Armenia. And that's about it from my end. So I'm going to go to the last slide and just say thank you. Let's get to work. We are ready to get to work. We've already been working, but we're ready for this new phase and to do new things. And uh, we thank you all for being with us today. And once again, thank you, Liana, Lucina, and Valentina, and Hasmik for being a great uh, event facilitator with me. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you, too.